Hi there, it's George from Any Old Music. Today we're going to do some musical arrangement, namely the rearrangement of some Mozart to see if we can turn it into something resembling a gothic horror soundtrack. As we delve into the rearrangement of Mozart's K545 Sonata, we'll uncover some of the fascinating techniques integral to my upcoming course, Orchestrating Gothic Horror. In Orchestrating Gothic Horror, we will be venturing into the sinister realm of horror orchestration. It'll be a deep dive into orchestrating a silent cinema score that was intended for uh, dramatic and horror scenes in the early 20th century. We'll explore various techniques from reimagining piano scores for an orchestra to employing uh, instrumental wizardry and mastering dynamics, all aimed at crafting hauntingly immersive soundtracks. So today as a demonstration, we're going to explore three pivotal techniques you'll encounter in the orchestrating Gothic horror course. These methods are essential for crafting spine-chilling scores that transport listeners to the eerie world of gothic horror. One area we'll be exploring is the art of transforming a piano score into an orchestral piece. This involves not just transcribing notes, but leveraging orchestral resources to intensify and adapt the original composition into something uh, suitably atmospheric. Another area we'll dive into is instrumental techniques, an invaluable arsenal for any horror composer. Today we'll use techniques such as tremolo, solponticello, muting, harmonics and doubling techniques to manipulate the orchestral sound palette, creating unfamiliar and unnerving sounds for listeners. While the course introduces even more techniques and goes into more depth on each technique uh, individually, today we'll simply be putting these five to good and hopefully effective use. Lastly, we'll strategically deploy dynamics such as crescendos, diminuendos, fortes and pianos. Uh, this goes beyond volume control, it's more about manipulating sound to evoke shadows and create a sense of lurking danger. Orchestrating Gothic Horror teaches you how to use the orchestra to create dynamic drama, enhancing the horror and anxiety in the music. Today we'll use dynamics to evoke that sense of lurking danger. So today we're delving into the world of orchestration by taking on a piece entirely outside the horror genre, Mozart's K545 Facile Sonata. Uh, why, you might ask? Because sometimes it's the most unexpected journeys that unveil the most valuable lessons. By attempting to pull Mozart's piece from the classical glance style into contemporary Gothic horror, we hope to uncover much more. Let's take a listen to the extract in its original form. horror piece acts as our canvas for experimentation. We'll traverse distant musical landscapes, exploring techniques like switching to the parallel minor and employing reharmonization, tools often used in horror music to introduce an unsettling aura. This adaptation isn't solely about transposing notes, it's about revealing a transformation, infusing a chilling essence into the seemingly serene notes of Mozart's sonata. Let's take a listen to the extract adapted to include the harmonies and tonality that I'll be using for today's orchestration. For today's demonstration, we're using a double winds orchestra template within Sibelius. In orchestrating Gothic horror, students have the flexibility to choose between larger or smaller ensembles. For me, the double winds orchestra strikes a perfect balance between versatility and requiring ingenuity. It offers a good range of instrumental colours, yet creative resourcefulness is still essential due to its moderate number of players. So without further ado then, let's immerse ourselves in the orchestration, or perhaps the rearrangement in this instance, of Mozart's Facile Sonata. Let's hope it's easier than what Mozart's Easy Sonata is for a novice pianist to play. Let's dive into trying to create our rearrangement of this Mozart's uh, Facile Sonata, K545. It's the 15th piano sonata of his, uh, in typically in C major, but we've cha we're changing it to C minor. Um, it did occur to me I should have probably put the piano part in here so we could see it, but I haven't done that. But hopefully it's quite a familiar piece that will... Um, we don't need it. <laughs> Perhaps I'm wrong. Uh, as I said uh, before, uh, we are going to be using... Sibelius's sort of pre-made template, which is a small orchestra template uh, with double winds. So we have two flutes, two oboes, two clarinets, and two bassoons typically. 
Although I've opted to bring in a bass clarinet for the second clarinet and then pick out on the first flute. Um, and then two horns, two trumpets were in there as standard. Don't think we're going to use any percussion for, for this today. And then some strings at the bottom here, a nice string orchestra, which presumably is a bit more, a bit smaller to match this sort of smaller woodwind and brass section, though not necessarily. Um, but yes, so I've added in time signature, key signature, which is now C minor. And I've also put Andante here. Whether I'd actually roll with Andante as my chosen performance marking, I don't know. Um, I've decided that I've just chosen Andante quickly because I know Sibelius reads that as 80 beats per minute, crotchet beats per minute uh, in 4-4, four, four, um, because that's the sort of slowest speed that I want. So that's another kind of recomposition thing, rearrangement thing we've done. We've slowed down the tempo. A bit naughty, I know. Um but anyway, yes, as I said before, um, we're going to use a sort of uh, doubling that is not at the unison or octave. So we're going to use what's known as a doubling at an interval other than unison and octave. We're going to try and vaguely outline the sort of overtone structure uh, that occurs naturally within uh, the performance of notes uh, fire instruments <laughs> that was a really weird way of saying that so obviously when we play notes on an instrument they're not comprised of literally just the pitch that we're playing but they have these what's known as overtones within them the sort of sound and we think it's something to do with the kind of overtone which ones sound more or less above the instrument that give an instrument its unique sound so these overtone structures affect timbre in essence um, so I'm going to try and use that to try and create a sound that is a bit more unfamiliar, a bit more haunting, trying to affect timbre through orchestration, in other words, um, to try and create that disconcerting gothic horror feel. And it is quite a demanding and risky, or one of the more risky ways of approaching an orchestration, at least if we were going to do this in a live setting, because it requires kind of careful sort of intonation, tuning, things like that. Um, yeah, basically, and it also requires more instruments to carry it out. Uh, I've decided I'm going to use woodwinds as the main vehicle of the, the melody, uh, because I think as well, woodwinds have a kind of horror kind of sound to them, uh, possibly because they reflect the organ, which is situated a lot in Gothic horror scores. Um, so we're going to use those to do our orchestration heart foreground and i want clarinets because they have a unique overtone structure um, so they're going to be my main sounding instrument in this orchestration so you can vaguely hear that minor version of the theme nice darker sound which comes with the uh, different tonality and rather than write out the just have a trill marker I want to write mine out or I've decided beforehand and I'm thinking about doing this to have a uh, written out kind of modernty figure here I also want this to be MF and I want it to be constant as well because I'm going to have other parts that sort of come in and come out and give that kind of feeling of something lurking in the shadows and coming forwards and uh, a bit of a horror trope, I think, there. Um, I've also decided that at the, I do want to double at the unison on a double read, a single double read for each part, because I just thought it created a bit more of an interesting sound, whether that would translate into a real performance have to test it uh, um, but this is my kind of theoretical hypothesizing approach to orchestration um and it's easier to take things out than add them in so yes we've got the clarinets here and then what i want to do is essentially well, i'm going to manipulate this slightly use flute two 
I want to keep Mark One Flute One on here because it's probably a more difficult uh, tennis car, and I want to have it up the fifth because I want it not to be on doubling at the octave, which is typical, but doubling that 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 fifth above, which is actually what the first overtone the clarinet creates. So we're going to try and sort of draw out that weird timbre a little more, create bit of a weird effect and i would hope this actually comes across better in a live performance if it if performed well the note performer uh, creates uh, i'm also considering asking for overtones um, not, um like overblowing on those but uh i need to go and ask a, <laughs> a woodwind player um to check <laughs> what the hell they would interpret this and whether it does make sense or not oops so i want to simplify this doubling that note there oh how did i do that silly mistake Good about temper there um so the flute here it's doubling with the harmonic so i should have probably actually played this uh back probably need to change that as well yep so i can get playback working for you so it's probably not been playing for you before and i need to share it up here there we go sound good now so this is just clarinet with bass clarinet or as note performer but plays it think when you add bassoon into the mix here uh oh, we want the oboe as well later on these kind of unison doubles they make it sound a bit more, more french horny um that could be me um but that's what i get whether it'll come across because this is supposed to be played more delicately than the other parts um who knows but here's what the sound is <laughs> So when the oboe and you get that kind of sheeny top bit with the partials, um, double reeds have quite a rich overtone structure. Um, so this is with the flutes added in as well with the harmonics. They could probably perform it without the harmonics. Um, and then what I actually want is a major sixth above that again, because that what we'd ordinary ordinarily have. Well, I'm going to change this in a second. What we'd ordinarily have is the octave here in a standard overtone structure. So obviously above this note, this C here, we tend to have an eighth above, which would be this one here. Then the next one turns the fifth. And the next one is a four. So you get that octave again. And then you get the third of that. Um, and that's what we're trying to create here. However, I want mine to sort of fit in with the... Uh, oops, I'm on the right bit. Fit in with the underlying kind of tone. Well, not underlying harmony, but the overarching... Uh, tonality, which is C minor. So I'm going to switch that to an E flat. I'm not on D, really. Um, which, no, that is right. Um, so that is a more harmonic change. No, it's, not, it's still tonal change. Probably want E flat there, but I have then. I want F sharp there. No, I have natural. Um, 
people. Let's see, that's what we've got the F down here. Hmm. Flat, maybe. Although in the right line, harmony is going to be the major. So I'm wondering whether I want a flat there, a natural rather. Uh, I want to take the harmonics out of this section. Give me sure on piccolo harmonics. Um, and brackets to make sure they sort of stay there. Seems a bit more deliberate when I put them in brackets in case someone thinks about changing it without my uh, permission. So, you know, we had that before, and now we've got this one added in. I mean, it would be interesting to hear just these two together. That was a bit strange, which I obviously want here, this gothic horror kind of uh, effect. So I think we're getting close to having this just about where we want it. We'll listen to them all together. Yeah, that's there or thereabouts, I think. Um, Hopefully it's sounding nice and haunting for you guys. <laughs> maybe, maybe not. Maybe you sat there thinking, what, well, is that it? Um, but I, I don't think so. I think hopefully you're uh, thinking, yeah, yeah, that sounds quite haunting. Um, the next part is I want to try and add in some harmonies. And I was going to use a string section for this kind of the bulk of the background, although we are going to use the brass as well to kind of add some colour. Um, and I want the upper strings, these two violins and violas, to be like the kind of bulk of the harmony, because I'm thinking of using the cello as a kind of middle ground, and the bass as uh, it very much in the background, but kind of adding a bit of emphasis, because we're going to use those dynamic shifts to... Um, create more horror jump scare, well, not necessarily jump scares, but that, that, those kind of shifts in dynamic that we often hear in a kind of um, horror score. Um, as I said before, I was kind of crescendi and diminuendi that kind of make, give the impression of something coming from the shadows and moving back again. Um, and I am changing the harmonic the arrangement quite substantially here. Uh, I'm going to use unmeasured tremolos as well. Um, bring it this. I did want to sort of keep that kind of Alberti bass structure intact by having that back and forth there, but it's an augmented kind of structure. But then I was going to persist. And I want that to be F sharp actually here. I'm using B, substituting the dominant for uh, what was G major, I'm substituting that for B minor. Um, I also use some pomp, although I don't think some pomp works so well on here. Um, maybe would asking more to some pomp help playback? so much, although I do want very much that sultante cello sound. Actually, in an ideal situation, I'd probably like them to move from a kind of sultasto to a sultante position, but we'll just settle for sultante. Um, we're going to use these kind of things. I have thought about this before, obviously. I don't necessarily write like so cleanly as this, but I didn't think it would make compelling viewing for you to see me sort of try things out uh, beforehand so i have like thought about this sketch some stuff out um so don't be sat there like how does this guy just write this so quickly so confidently um i have obviously prepared for this video <laughs> uh, and i don't want uh, thinking, um, 
uh, or possibly even putting you off a little bit, thinking this guy must have prepared for this um, already, which I have, obviously. Um, so we want that, and then we want something similar through this next section. Um, if you want to fill out these harmonies. Might be the easiest thing because I want them all moving mostly together. scary um although do i want it to go to c that's on the c although we might need to change it when i put my middle ground in quite a lot of stems through there i just want it to be clear that it's unmeasured I suppose i could have written sort of an unmeasured tremolo there's fewer lines sort of sometimes suggest a kind of rhythmic tremolo in which you're sort of trying to get semi-quavers perhaps demi-semi-quavers rather than just you know all the players playing asynchronous tremolos, which sound quite effective on um, sections, because obviously not everyone's doing it perfectly timed or as closely timed as they can. Um, similar for this next section, uh, more stems or whatever they're called, uh, lines for it, dashes. I can't feel what they're called off the top of my head. kind of effect. Oops. Kind of accents and stuff to try and draw out the uh, kind of like I said that, that dynamic shifting. Which will sound quite effective I think once we start to put it in. Um, once we start to put piece everything together. And now I'm going to probably in a minute break uh, that I have where it's sort of to not play things too soon or rely on playback too shortly. I want to obviously demonstrate to you guys how it's sort of taking shape. Uh, the reason I don't recommend not necessarily using playback too soon is because you can have playback put you off. <laughs> you rely on it, I think. If you do it too early, it can present a half-baked idea that's just not ready um to be heard and then you sort of lose confidence in it perhaps and then um uh, go off the idea and give up before it's really a chance to shine but yes as i as i said i've obviously uh, thought about this stuff much more before so i sort of know what i'm planning on doing I probably have thought a bit more about voicings and stuff because I'd have had to have thought what notes, which notes I'm using a bit more. Um, but basically, all I'm doing is taking the underlying harmony and having them, you know, switch between notes in the chords. I think that largely the chords are obviously to a bar. Um, so F minor to uh, C, yeah, C minor to G to C minor. So yeah, I'm just using movement between them, like sort of adjacent notes of the harmony. Let's have a listen. Missimo? And then let's have a listen with the fans with everything, the melody in. Ooh, so yeah, um, taking shape. Might have been put off by that, actually, if I'd 
was writing this first time through. I'm like, hmm, sure, but then my process might have been to add what I'm going to add now. So <laughs> who knows? Um, usually my approach is a bit more fragmented um, when first going through stuff, unless I have a very clear idea what's going on. But yes, I said I wanted to add a middle ground, and I felt kind of around offering some kind of notes around the harmony to add a bit of dissonance and counterpoints to it might add a bit of kind of interest actually i don't want i had originally put these as unmeasured tremolos in the violin uh, or in the celli sorry but i've decided to go for a more natural sound and just rely on dynamics so they're a bit more prominent um, so yeah, I had a kind of middle ground. So very much emphasising the harmony. We've got strong notes here, the harmony, but then we've got these nice little bits. Harmonic minor. Um, and then it's just sort of bringing it out. Like I said, I've already sort of worked this out, so I might have thought about it a bit more. And leave that actually and have an FP. Ooh, quick tweak in the actual uh, workings of this. Well, around, I'll put that P in there, that's probably more for playback. So it's coming in and out, and this is what it should sound like if I've written it incorrectly. The rest of the string then? Everything. And lastly, in the string section, uh, I can't remember if I did it in this precise order when I was thinking about how to do this. And sketching out ideas. I'm not sure if I added the bass in last or even celli in last. But I always knew I wanted the contrabass to sort of, in some respects, emphasize the harmony, but also add some kind of accents and things to um, bring out that dynamic quality even further. But also, not to the extent that using a timpani might do that. So, percussion, that's why I'm not, I'm not going to use timpani. I'm using the other ones that are a little less percussive because I don't want them to be too. Uh, climactic to uh, emphatic is probably the word I'm looking for. I want to put my pin somewhere, somewhere around here. I want to go the other way here. This dynamic slightly off, so it doesn't not immediate crescendo. MF. What I wanted to do was finish off by emphasizing that middle ground. I used pizzicato. So 
good here, get like a bit of a switch of dynamic. <laughs> This is the whole string section. My bad. Dynamics. Sierra. everything. Very nice. I don't say so myself. Right then, for the um, horns then, I decided uh, I'd bring them in. I don't bring the trumpets in until the second two bars here. And the horns are going to use, uh, well, they could use uh, mutes, I suppose. It depends on what's going on around it as to how quickly they can get mutes on. Obviously, it's, it's, I suppose the start of the sonata, so they could just put mutes in. I was thinking hand stops because they can really tightly stop the note. Um, I'm going to write this in at pitch, but what actually happens is when a, a French horn uh, mutes their instrument with their hand, uh, generally it goes up a semitone. There is another kind of muting by the hand that actually has it drop a semitone, but in this instance, I want that nice tight uh, hand stop where they really get the hand in the bell of the instrument and are able to elevate the pitch semitone. So what they would need to do is I would either need to write it out at a different pitch, which I'm not going to do. Uh, but they might need to obviously transpose. And I could write that in, actually. Um, and that would actually, in some respects, clarify the mute hand stopping that I want. I suppose the advantage of asking them to transpose is they might be able to decide to use a mute rather than because if I then wrote the transposition, they decide they want to use a mute, uh, they'd have to transpose back. But I suppose it's they probably would hope um, able to do either either transposition. Um, I don't know what it is like for French horns, but when you play uh, another brass instrument. Like trumpet, which is my instrument, you generally train to do a bit of transposition on the fly. Um, I don't want the tie. I'm going to write the second horn time, and I'm using this plus marking to create um, create the um, hand stop. Ask for the hand stop. Um, and I want this to be EP Symphony. And then above that, I'm going to have the first horn using hand stops as well. Different dynamics. I'm going to put these above just to make sure that they're read only by the first uh, first horn. So I'm just checking because I'm the right voice, so it actually plays back correctly. MP. About close enough for jazz. So this should be the line that I've created here, as I say, using hand stops. Yeah, so there's not a lot to it, but it is providing the background and it helps just, in my mind even though it is only the background it does seem to help just pull the sound together so it, it blurs over this kind of stop here uh with the strings um which would 
was quite stark. There was a sudden drop in sort of uh, density, if you like, sound intensity or whatever you want to call it, and before the, the clarinets come back in. Whereas the horns, as we'll hear if I play everything together, um, or maybe I should play them with the background first. Uh, you'll hear it sort of, sort of smooths over a little bit. That, and then if we play it all together. Still not sold on this at the end of here, I don't think. But uh, what I was trying to demonstrate is this idea of using the overtone structure to kind of try and create some more unfamiliar timbres. So it might need some experimentation. And ideally, I suppose, rather than risking doing something like this straight into kind of studio recording or something like that, I'll try and workshop it perhaps. Um, if I had some generous friends. <laughs> <laughs> um, who might lend their time. So, yes. Um, last bit is I want to add trumpet through here. And for this bit, I actually... Too much loud. I want them to... Uh, uh, play... this with a cut mute. Um, but I want it to be tight, because uh, what actually happens is you can adjust the cut mute, uh, or a lot of them. There are fixed ones, so it is a bit risky, I suppose, using tight. But you can generally um, adjust the cut position and put it closer, so there's a, a smaller gap between the end of the trumpet bell and where the mute sort of into contact so i want it quite tight with a tiny gap and that generally darkens and sort of uh veils the sound a lot more and i thought that would suit gothic horror and they would be able to play out a bit more because it would affect their sound so much that they would probably need to play up a little bit um, which i think would work quite well now for this ending obviously we don't get the full effect of that uh, in Former. But that's not feeding back. For some reason, I've decided not to use headphones. Give mistake again. Both of these to play the fourth. I don't know, so we should get something like this. And with the horns. Yeah. So this is a very much an effect. Not much to it on its own, but as we start adding things in, hopefully you can see, or hear rather, um, how it creates an overall effect, which is much more dramatic and colourful. So they're pretty much all prominent, obviously, where they play out a bit on that attack, which is what I wanted. I wanted that further emphasis of the accent, uh, that kind of jump scary vibe. A bit more angular, pointed, a bit more agitated, um, which obviously the tremolos contribute to as well. Brings there actually. That's, I want the viola to move slightly differently. 
Um, ends up on that G with the cello. Better, so we'll just have a last listen, and that will see us finish this dramatic gothic horror orchestration. I hope you've enjoyed it. Let's have a listen to this masterpiece. That's it then. That was today's journey through the orchestration of Mozart Sonata K545, uh, which unveiled crucial insights into transforming uh, a beautiful classical gallant melody, not intended for horror or scaring anyone at all, into a chilling orchestral composition. These techniques that we've learned, using instrumental techniques to manipulate timbre, rethinking piano parts to, uh, to be more idiosyncratic for orchestra, and using dynamics effectively are pivotal in our upcoming course, Orchestrating Gothic Horror, which aims to equip you uh, to craft immersive soundscapes that remain stuck like little worms in the minds of your listeners. Understanding these methods is vital for composers seeking to infuse eerie elements into their music, making them indispensable in the realm of Gothic horror and even in the wider horror genre and possibly beyond that genre as well. If you're ready to delve deeper into the world of haunting melodies and eerie orchestrations, join us in orchestrating gothic horror to master these techniques and create captivating soundscapes that will terrify. Enroll now and elevate your composition skills to chilling new heights. <laughs> <laughs>